Well, good morning. <laughs> it, 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 that sounded like when my teenagers come down in the morning and I say good morning to them. Good morning. <laughs> uh, well, it's so good to see you guys all this morning. My name is Doug. I'm one of the pastors here at Venture Missionary Church. And this morning we're kicking off a seven-week series called Messiah. And uh, the focus of this series is to understand more about this Jesus called the Messiah. And the goal of this series is to help us get a better understanding of what this idea of Messiah even means. What does the word Messiah mean? Where does it come from? Why do we call Jesus the Messiah? And why, 2,000 years later, does it really matter? So um, in just a minute, we're going to be starting in the book of John. Um, We're going to start our study in the book of John, chapter 1. So that's where we'll be in just a moment. But before we get to that point, um, I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to look up um, at the screen behind me and uh, tell me if you recognize any of those movies. Recognize some of those movies? Anybody have a favorite up there? Matrix? Who said Lego movie? That's a good one right there. Okay. All right. Nope, nobody Beverly Hills Ninja? Yeah. Reed? No, anybody? Yes, all right, Dustin. Yeah, it's a terrible, terrible movie, but it deserves to be up there. I'll explain why. <coughs> Each of these films has a common theme. Let me explain. Each of these films revolve around a main character who is thought to be the chosen one. All of these films has a hero as part of the story that is thought to be the chosen one. From Kung Fu Panda to The Matrix um, to Star Wars to The Lord of the Rings and my personal favorite, Emmett from the Lego movie. And if you've never seen the Lego movie, please don't just think because it's a cartoon that you shouldn't bother watching it. It's so good. It's a really, really good movie. But in all of these movies, um, there's a common theme. There's an oppressed people or um, an impending attack that can only be resolved by a hero, a hero known as the chosen one. And in most of the cases, this hero is the long-awaited fulfillment of a prophecy or an ancient promise that people have been looking to for centuries and for generations. So all of these stories kind of revolve around the same idea, that there's some sort of a problem. There's an impending attack or there's an oppressed people, and they're longing for, they're looking for, they're waiting for this promised hero, this chosen one who was prophesied about, who one day will come and fix the problem. And in the case of the most of the movies just in the nick of time. So for those of us who know the story of Jesus, it's really easy for us to hear these stories and think about some of these stories and see the connection, right? We instantly think of Jesus as the ultimate expression of the chosen one. In fact, that's what this word Messiah means. So if you've ever wondered, like, what is that word Messiah? Where does that come from? We're going to get into a little bit more of where it came from, but it actually has this connotation of the chosen one, one who has been chosen and selected for a specific purpose. It also means anointed one, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this morning, this is all we're going to try to do. We're just going to try to lay a foundation, because for the next seven weeks, from now all the way to Easter, and actually a week after Easter, we're going to be in this series called Messiah. And so this morning, the goal is to just lay a foundation so that we come away from this morning understanding this idea of Jesus as the Messiah. And we're going to look specifically at three things that John the Baptist says about Jesus that reveal him as Messiah. Now, Normally, if you've, um, if you've been here when I've taught before, um, you know, you know that, that normally I try to incorporate some humor and try to have some fun um, with it. And, this, and, and um, over the course of the week and yesterday as I was preparing this message, I realized like this message didn't really lend itself to any humor. And so if you walked in and you're like, oh, I like this guy. He's pretty funny. Nope, not today. <laughs> not, not really going to be funny at all. Um, and so if you were hoping for that, you can still walk out now and I won't be offended, but you cannot get your money back. So um, well, that was kind of funny. But that's about it. That's about all the funny you're going to get. So um, what we are going to do is we are going to turn to the book of John chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app, or if you want to use one of the Bibles in the pew rack in front of you, we're going to go to the book of John. The book of John is one of the four Gospels. Um, All of these four books tell the story of Jesus. They don't say everything that he did, but they describe some of the things that Jesus said, some of the things that he taught. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
um, are what's called the synoptic gospels. They're known as the synoptic gospels because they tend to tell um, similar stories. They have sort of a similar vantage point, sort of similar view on certain things that Jesus said and did. But John's gospel stands alone. It's got some stories that aren't found elsewhere. Um, it's got a perspective that's a little bit unique. And John is the only eyewitness. So the other gospel writers um, are, are secondhand accounts. John's gospel is a firsthand account. He's describing things that he saw as one of Jesus' own disciples. So this guy John that wrote the gospel of John is one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Um, the one referred to as the one whom Jesus loved. Uh, brother with James, son of Zebedee. So um, what we're going to do this morning um, is we're going to jump in right at the very beginning of the Gospel of John into what we could call a prologue. Um, now a prologue is when an author or a storyteller or a director needs to fill in the audience on some important information before the story actually begins. Um, a prologue might include some historical context or some backstory about a particular character or it might kind of set up the main conflict in the story. Basically, it's the author's way of saying, before we get to the story, you need to understand this. If you don't understand this, then this over here isn't really going to make sense. And so what we read here in John chapter 1, verses 1 through really 18, is, is the prologue. It's just John saying, you need to know this first. So we're going to read um, John chapter 1, um, starting in verse 1 and going through verse 14. And in this, he gives us some backstory about Jesus. And he uses two main metaphors to describe Jesus. He calls Jesus the Word, and he calls Jesus the Light. So in chapter 1, verse 1, I'm going to read through verse 14. Here we go. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent by God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. This is God's word for us this morning. So what we're going to try to do together this morning is we're going to read through a little bit more of John chapter 1 in just a few minutes. And then we're going to look at three key statements that John the Baptist makes about Jesus that reveals Jesus as the Messiah. And then at the very end, we'll wrap it up with an understanding of why that even matters to us sitting here today in 2018 in Ventura. Why does any of this actually even matter? So um, the prologue that we just read kind of spoils the plot for anyone that doesn't already know that Jesus is God. So anyone reading this, this prologue at the very beginning for the first time, um, it's going to spoil it for anyone who doesn't know that Jesus is God. Because right out of the gate, Jesus comes right out and says very specifically that Jesus is way more than just a man. He's way more than a good man or a prophet or a respected teacher. Even though there are millions of people around this planet that that's their impression of Jesus. That sure, Jesus existed, but he was just a good guy, a moral teacher, um, you know, did some little magic tricks and kind of wowed the people. But that's all he was. But that's not what John is saying. John is saying in no um, uncertain terms that Jesus is God. He's saying that from the beginning of time, Jesus was with God and Jesus was himself God. And we find out that through Jesus, God has revealed himself to people. He says this at the end of the prologue in verse 18, John writes this, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him 
known. So the way that we know who God is, the way that we see God, the way that we experience God is through Jesus. What we, may, what we know about God in many ways is revealed to us through the person of Jesus. What's God like? What does God do? Well, when we watch Jesus, when we observe the stories of Jesus, when we read the teachings of Jesus, when we watch him heal, when we watch him talk to people and give uh, respect and dignity and value to people that the rest of the world sort of discounted, that gives us a picture of who God is, that God is revealed to us in part through Jesus. So the prologue closes. If this was a movie, the prologue scene would sort of, you know, fade out to black. And then the opening scene of John chapter 1, verse 19 would open. And we'd hear birds um, and we'd see a man down in a river right in the middle of a desert called the River Jordan. And we'd be introduced to a man named John the Baptist who is living out in the desert and he's baptizing people. Now, John is a super intense guy, and so he's preaching a message of repentance. He's calling the people to repent and turn from their sin and turn back to God. And there's, there's dozens and, and even hundreds of people that are returning back to God and hearing this message of repentance and are allowing John to baptize them in this river. Now, don't get confused by the fact that we've got two Johns, okay? So let me make sure that this is clear. So on one hand, we've got John who wrote this gospel. He was a disciple of Jesus who later on in his life wrote down some of the things that Jesus did and said. And that's the book that we're reading right now is the book of John. One of the people that John writes about is this man named John the Baptist, who we know from some of the other, what the, some of the other Gospels say, is a man who was sent ahead of Jesus to sort of prepare the way, to prepare people's hearts for this coming Messiah. The Gospel of Matthew in chapter 3, we find out that John the Baptist came to prepare people for the coming um, of Jesus, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. John's clothes, Matthew tells us, um, was the, made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. He ate locust and wild honey, kind of a weird guy. People went out to him from all over this region, and they confessed their sins, and John baptized them in the water of the Jordan River. So here we have John baptizing people in this river when all of a sudden some antagonistic Jewish leaders show up on the scene imagine the imperial march music kind of playing in the background as these Jewish leaders sort of march in and they start peppering John with questions who are you are you Elijah now Elijah was a, a Jewish prophet who had lived 900 years before so John goes no I'm not Elijah and they said well then who are you are you a prophet give us an answer what do you say about yourself and so John answers them in some very specific ways. In verse 20, he says, I am not the Messiah. Now that's key phrase number one, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. But he says, I am not the Messiah. I'm just baptizing people in water. But among you stands one that you don't even know. This is where it gets interesting. He says, he is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. Now remember, as John the Baptist is talking here, he's talking to people who have no idea what's about to happen. They have no idea who Jesus is. They have no idea what Jesus is going to do. They have no idea that he's the Messiah. And they certainly know, don't know that he's going to die on a cross and then three days later be raised back to life. They have no idea any of this. All they know at this point is that there's this really intense kind of weird guy out in the desert eating bugs and calling people to repent and they're being stirred in their heart and so they're coming and they're being baptized. That's all they know at this point. Now we know because we read the, pro, the prologue. So we know that this Messiah that, that John is talking about, this, this guy that's coming, that's already here, whose sandals he's not even worthy to untie, that that guy we know is Jesus, the word, the light that John described in the prologue. So the very next day, so John's having this conversation with these Jewish leaders, and then the very next day, Jesus shows up. John's down at the river. People are coming to him. He's preaching messages. People are like, oh my gosh, you're right. I need to turn from my sin. I need to repent. The kingdom of God is here. I want to be baptized. And so he's having lines of people come down to the water, and he's baptizing them. And I just imagine, like, mid-baptized, he looks up, and he sees Jesus coming. And I just imagine, he, like, drops the guy under water. He's like, this is the guy I was telling you about. This is the Messiah. This is the one. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
And I always imagine John sort of getting really like wound up and excited about this. Kind of like I always imagine that scene in Elf when Buddy sees Santa and he's like, Santa, Sa- it's him. I know him. Like I imagine that sort of scene. Like, like, like John is baptizing, sees Jesus, stops what he's doing and tells everybody around him, this is the guy I was telling you about. And he calls him something really specific. He uses this phrase, Lamb of God. And that's our key phrase number two. And we're going to come back to that um, in just a moment as well. But there's one more key phrase that I want to point out. It's this theologically charged statement that John makes about Jesus in verse 32, 33, and 34. John says this. He says, I saw the Spirit. He's like verifying what he said. He's like, I saw it. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven like a dove and remain on Jesus. I myself... I I didn't know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, this is God speaking to John, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then John says, I have seen and I testify that this, this guy, this one right here is God's chosen one. And that phrase, God's chosen one, is our third key statement that we're going to go back and look at. So what we're going to do with the rest of our time here in just a few minutes that we have left is we're going to walk through each of these key statements that John the Baptist made about Jesus as they reveal that he is the Messiah. So first of all, John says, I'm not the Messiah, but the Messiah is coming. Second, he says, behold, look, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then the third thing he says is, this is God's chosen one. So first we're going to look at the word Messiah. So that's the whole title of this whole series. Most of us in this room have at least heard that word. Some of us have a good understanding of maybe where it came from. But I want to make sure that we all have a good, accurate starting point on understanding what Messiah means. So the word Messiah comes from a Hebrew word, Masach. Um, M-A-S-A-H is how it would be rendered in English. Um, and what it means is it means to smear or to anoint. So this Hebrew word Masach um, means to smear something or to, to pour liquid over it. So you might smear paint on a building, you would use this word. Um, you might pour liquid over something um, to cleanse it or to cover it, and you would use this word. And the origin of this word is actually pretty interesting. I find this stuff interesting. Um, it actually comes from a practice that shepherds had of pouring oil on a sheep's head to protect the sheep from lice and other Insects. We go, what? Let me explain. See, what would happen is in in these days, they didn't have, um, you know, some of the ways that we have to keep insects away. And so they found that all of these lice and these insects would burrow deep into the wool of the sheep and climb up towards the head and get inside the ears and then burrow in and cause diseases and sometimes even death um, among these sheep. And so what the shepherds discovered is that by pouring oil over the sheep, it would, it would make the wool um, slippery and so that as the insects would try to latch on, they couldn't grab on and then they would go um, and find something else. So it would actually protect the sheep. So what started as a very practical kind of way of just protecting sheep actually began over time to become something of a symbol. It became somewhat symbolic of blessing, protection, and empowerment. So again, what started as just a way to keep sheep from getting diseases sort of symbolically became in the culture this this symbol of blessing and protection and empowerment. And we see this all throughout the Old Testament. We see that any time that, that God, um, God would use this as a sign that he was consecrating or, or setting someone apart for a particular role, an anointed one was someone with a special, God-ordained, God-chosen purpose. Usually a prophet, a priest, or a king. In Leviticus chapter 8, we see Moses anointing Aaron as the priest over all of Israel. And he literally poured oil over his head. It ran down his beard. Later on in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, we see the prophet Samuel anointing David as a boy to be the next king over Israel. And what does he do? He takes out a horn full of oil, uncaps it, and pours the oil over David as a way of anointing, sort of symbolically setting him apart for this special chosen role that God had for him. Now, so we've got the Hebrew word mashach which means, which is where we get our word Messiah, and the Greek translation. So Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament 
most of it written and recorded in Greek. So in the Greek, which is what the New Testament that we're reading here in John chapter 1, instead of using the word Messiah, you'll also, you'll all often see the word Christ, which is taken from the Greek word Christos. Now, I always thought, growing up, I always thought that Christ was Jesus' last name. <laughs> Maybe you did too. I don't know. I always thought it was like, you know, there's Mr. and Mrs. Christ, and then there's little baby Jesus Christ, and like, I'm Doug Colby, and he's Jesus Christ. Like, I just thought Christ was the last name. I never, I kind of wondered, like, what was his middle name, but it never really says what his middle name. I think it uh, has the initial H, but I don't know. That's just something I've heard people say. So, so Christ was sort of the... <laughs> So anyway, George liked that one. Um, I guess I am kind of funny today. Hey, all right. So, but, but the idea, so Christ, this word Christ isn't a name. It's actually a title that, that derives itself from this idea of Messiah. So we get anointing, Masach, translated into English as Messiah. Over in the Greek New Testament, this word Christos, which is translated as Christ. And those two words, Messiah or Christ, are interchangeable. They mean the same thing. They are a title that that ascribes to Jesus this idea of being the chosen one or the anointed one. Anointed, set apart, consecrated for a very specific and special calling that God was going to perform. Now, this Messiah, this word Messiah had all sorts of deep historical rooted meaning to the people at Jesus' time. This wasn't just a word, oh, anointed, maybe he's going to be like some random king or something. This idea of Messiah had a very deep, deep meaning to the people at Jesus' time. These were a people who were oppressed. They were a people who were oppressed by a violent and pagan Roman Empire. And they were longing for the day. These people for generations had been longing for the day when God would finally send the Messiah, the promised hero to throw off the oppressive hand of the Romans and set up a new kingdom, God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And they had all sorts of ancient prophecies that echoed through from generation to generation that that led to all sorts of ideas about what the Messiah would do when he arrived. And it starts all the way back in the Garden of Eden. These prophecies, these messianic prophecies that describe the coming Messiah started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, after the serpent deceives Adam and Eve, God curses the serpent and says, there will be a day when the Son of Man will crush your head under his heel. And as we look back through time, we see that that was a, a, prophecy, a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And then we fast forward to Genesis chapter 12, when God establishes his covenant with Abraham and says, through you, through your descendants, all people on earth are going to be blessed. And then we follow it to Jacob's blessing over Judah about this coming king who's going to rule with a scepter. And then we follow that through to to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we see that God establishes a covenant with David, that through David's line, there's going to come another king who's going to rule and reign in, in, in the line of David and rule and reign over the people and establish finally, once and for all, God's kingdom here on earth. And then that prophecy weaves its way all the way through the book of Psalms and all the way through the prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. And so by the time Jesus arrives, by the time John is speaking, these people have been hanging on and hanging on to this thread of hope that one day the promised Messiah that has echoed all the way through their history is one day going to arrive and rescue them and be the hero that they've always hoped for. And that's why John the Baptist gets excited. Because he's finally witnessing the fulfillment of thousands of years worth of prophecy. Jesus the Messiah, and it's bigger and better than anything he could have imagined. Let's move to, to wrap things up here. Um, th- we've got two more phrases, but they're going to go quick. The next key phrase that we're going to look at really quick occurs when John spots Jesus coming towards him at the Jordan, uh, Jordan River. And he says, look, everybody, it's the guy I was telling you about. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And again, this little phrase is packed with Messiah meaning. John uses a very specific word here for Lamb. There were a few different words that he could have used, but he chose to use a word here, the word amnos, um, which, which referred to a sacrificial lamb. Not just any lamb, but one of the special, unblemished, perfect, one-year-old lambs that was used in the temple sacrifices. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament or you kind of have an idea of the Old Testament, then you'll be familiar with this idea that at the time that Jesus is, is, is showing up on the scene, 
Every morning and every evening in the temple, the priests would offer an unblemished lamb as a sacrifice. Uh, and this was, um, the, the purpose of this sacrifice was a system of atonement. This was a symbolic way of sort of staying in good standing with God by dealing with sin. Basically, the sin of the nation of Israel was symbolically transferred onto this lamb, uh, the sacrificial lamb, and it was kind of a, a temporary stopgap way of dealing with sin. We're going to offer up the sacrifice. Our sin is kind of going to get transferred on this sacrificial lamb. The priest is going to kill the lamb and sacrifice it, and, and me and God, you know, we as a nation and God, like, we're, we're good. And so that's how they dealt with sin. Now, Hebrews chapter 10 reminds us that Jesus came to be the once and for all ultimate sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. So when John sees Jesus, he can't help but get excited. He says, look, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, what's cool about this is that no one at the time had any idea what this meant. Nobody had any idea that this is what the Messiah came to accomplish. When they thought about the Messiah taking away sin, they thought that the, the, the Messiah was going to be like a king who would call people to obedience and would rid the world of sin through, through establishing a reign um, of people being obedient to God. So that's how they pictured this idea of the Messiah dealing with sin. They had no idea that Messiah would take away the sins of the world by offering forgiveness and grace and mercy. They were expecting a military king who would rule with an iron scepter, not a savior, a merciful savior who would sacrifice himself as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. But that's what John is pointing out when he points to Jesus and says, this is the Lamb of God. As he's bringing up and conjuring up all of this rich imagery of this sacrificial lamb, which tells us more about what Jesus came to accomplish. I'm going to close with this. Um, John ends his testimony in verse 34 by saying, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Now, some of the manuscripts um, from, from you know, many, many years ago use the phrase God's son, but the, older, the oldest manuscript evidence uses the phrase God's chosen one, which takes us back to that language of the Messiah. This idea of being chosen and set apart and consecrated and anointed for a specific purpose purpose. And John is saying, this guy, I testify, I stake my life on it, I claim that this is the guy, this is God's chosen one. Because the story of God's chosen one is the story of an oppressed and suffering people whose last thread of hope hangs on this ancient promise that one day, that one day Messiah will come and defeat the enemy, eliminate the suffering, heal the brokenness, restore what has been stolen and destroyed, and make things right. We live in a similar world. We, we live in a world where a missionary can be abducted and held for 16 months. We live in a world where a 19-year-old can walk onto a high school campus and kill 17 innocent people. We live in a world where a murderous thief called cancer steals life away from people that we love. We live in a world that's still filled with hatred and racism and selfishness and greed. And we too wait for the completion of Jesus' messianic mission. The mission that was prophesied about all the way through the Old Testament. The mission that John, in his mind, saw little glimpses of and began to point out and shout out. The mission that Jesus began to accomplish through his, through his, through his earthly ministry. The, the, the mission that culminated with the death and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and three days later, the glorious resurrection that at Easter we're going to celebrate. And then this period that we're in now, this already and not quite yet, this idea that Messiah has come and has fulfilled his mission, but it's not complete. There's still this coming culmination when God will take everything that is wrong, everything that is broken, everything that is hurting, everything that is rotten and fractured and broken about this world, and put it all back together in a way that's beautifully restored. This is Jesus, the Messiah. And John, 
doesn't finish with the gospel of John. John also writes a book called the Apocalypse. We know it as the book of Revelation. And I wanna close by reading to you this last little passage out of Revelation chapter 21, almost to the very close of the Bible. And we read this. John says, I heard a loud voice. He gets this vision and he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and we will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain for the old order of things has passed away. And then it says that he who was seated on the throne, the voice of God himself came booming and said, I am and making everything new. Friends, this is Jesus, our Messiah. I'm gonna invite you to stand and we're gonna close in prayer and sing a, a chorus that we sang earlier that just reminds us of who this Jesus is, this Messiah, this anointed one, this chosen one, the Lamb of God. My hope is, is that this morning, we've all gained a little bit of a deeper understanding of, of, of this idea of Messiah, what it means, where this idea came from, and, and why Jesus fulfills everything spoken about in the Messiah. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at specific stories of what Jesus did, what Jesus said, interactions he had, miracles that he performed that demonstrate that he and he alone is our Messiah. I want to pray for us. God. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our savior, to be our sacrificial lamb that took our sins, our shortcomings, all the sin that has infected our lives. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to heal us, to restore us, to take our sins on his shoulders and bear them to the cross and die in our place. God, we bring you our suffering, our pain, our heartache, our sorrow, our fears, our anxiety, our depression, our lack. Lord, we lay it all down at your feet and we just ask that Jesus would be that Messiah in our lives. That one that rescues, that one that redeems, that hero that shows up just at the right time. And Lord, we look ahead to what is prophesied about in Revelation chapter 21. To that day when there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more mourning, there will be no more death, no more pain, no more sickness, no more disease. And Lord, we look ahead to that and we place our faith in you, Jesus, our Messiah. And it's in that powerful name that we pray. Amen.